This is part three of hematologic and neoplastic disorders, and we were on sickle cell anemia. Um, as we said, the problem is that hemoglobin becomes sickle shaped, which is that curved shape. Um, they're also rigid, so they uh, don't bend, and so then you get obstructions, and beyond where that obstruction occurs, the tissue gets ischemic. And the red blood cells break and get destroyed and other red blood cells get stuck in there and get destroyed. We don't see um, these uh, occlusive crises in under the first year because there's still a lot of fetal hemoglobin. The fetal hemoglobin does not sickle. It's as the fetal hemoglobin gets replaced by adult hemoglobin that issues start to happen. So it's, it's rare to see um, a problem in the first year. We can test uh, for sickle cell uh, disorder uh, with the sickle turbidity test. And this is one of those uh, tests that are done on, on every baby, just part of the newborn screening. Uh, it tells you if you're a carrier or have the disorder, but it doesn't separate between the two. So when if that comes back positive, then we need to do the hemoglobin electrophoresis in order to, to determine, is this baby just a carrier or do they actually have the disorder? And hopefully this makes sense. This is where the cells are going to clump and then beyond them, things don't get through. So you get ischemic tissue beyond it. So the organs that are, are most effective most often um, the joints are a big problem, but you can also have vital organs have a problem. In the brain, this is a CVA. Uh, acute um, uh, chest syndrome is when it happens um, in the lungs, or, or we can have it happen in the heart. We can have it happen in the spleen. Um, so in all the vital organs, uh, but the most common ones um, are not. Most are going to be these vaso-occlusive um, crises that just happen out in, in the, the tissue and especially in joints and they're very painful. Um, so old blood begins to clump and then it blocks the microcirculation and you get ischemia and little microinfarctions. Uh, so they'll present with fever pain and enlarged um, those painful areas. It can happen in the spleen, and this is called splenic sequestration. So it's a sequestered blood is held in the spleen. This can be life-threatening because the spleen can hold so much blood that they really become hypovolemic. Um, so you're going to see profound anemia, hypovolemia, and shock. So the main treatment is analgesics. Uh, we put these people usually on a PCA pump and hydration. We used to try and overhydrate them because we thought if we really fill up all the vessels, it'll push through some of those clots. But now they're saying just um, well hydrated, but not overhydrated. Uh, bed rest. We don't want them spending any more energy than they need to, right? They're already not bringing enough oxygen out to their tissues. Um, they can get um, acidic acidosis, right? Because metabolic acidosis, because hypoxic tissue, we're not clearing out the normal acidic waste products. So we need to be watching electrolytes and um, adjusting as needed for that. And then blood replacement. If a lot of those red cells break and they become anemic, um, or just the red cells they have aren't as efficient at carrying oxygen. Um, antibiotics, if there's an infection, we want to do that early, but they don't need antibiotics otherwise. And oxygen really is not of much help because the ischemic tissue is ischemic because there's no blood flow there. It's not a gas exchange problem in the lungs. So um, they say only administer oxygen if the saturations are low. So our goal is to prevent sickling episodes and then to treat any medical emergencies. So these kids, the cells sickle when they get sick or dehydrated. Um, so let's get them vaccin 
vaccinated so they don't get sick. We're going to be more aggressive in treating any infections. Um, possible prophylactic antibiotics. Uh, there is a medication out there, um, hydroxyurea, and this is an amazing drug. Um, when I was working at the hospital, we saw, unfortunately, saw these kids in frequently. Now it's rare because this hydroxyurea makes them make fetal hemoglobin. And if you remember, fetal hemoglobin doesn't sickle. So, uh, it's, it's for most of them a great medication. Um, many of them end up needing a splenectomy, partly because blood can pool in there and partly it gets clogged up, right? It's a filter and over time it gets clogged and doesn't work anymore anyway. But if you don't have a spleen, you're going to be a little bit immune suppressed. You're at risk for infection. Okay, another disorder that causes this is thalassemia. This one is inherited as well, but it's not a clear cut um you know, recessive kind of thing. Uh, so there are a couple types. We're only going to talk about beta thalassemia. So they say this one's autosomal recessive with varying expressivity. So it's not the clear cut one out of four. Um, but you do have to have parents who are carriers. So the problem with this is the hemoglobin is abnormal. So this structurally impaired red blood cell has a very short half-life. Um, so you have anemia just because you can't make as much blood as you need to because it doesn't live long enough. So it also means you're chronically hypoxic, right? Because red blood cells are what carry oxygen. So you're going to have headache, irritability, uh, precordial and bone pain, exercise intolerance, anorexia, um, bloody noses, epistaxis, and that's all from that chronic hypoxia. So we want to detect this early. Um, remember, pallor, not cyanosis. Uh, it's going to infect growth, so failure to thrive. You're going to have the enlarged spleen and liver, um, and then the anemia, and it can be it will be severe anemia in that beta thalassemia. So the treatment is blood transfusions. And that is because you cannot make enough blood to keep up with it. And so the poor bone marrow is going crazy trying to make enough. And what we want to do is suppress that overaction of the bone marrow. And the only way to do that is to give blood. Um, they may need the spleen out. And by giving all this blood, we have to watch for iron overload. And it may need to be treated with chelating um, drugs. And when somebody has this and they're doing that crazy overproduction, one of the bones uh, that will overgrow is this frontal bone right here. So you get frontal bossing. So let's talk about clotting disorders. Um, some different ones, uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura, uh, ITP, uh, disseminated intervascular coagulation, and then um, hemophilia, which are factor deficiencies. So ITP, uh, this is usually idiopathic. That's what the I stands for. So we don't really know what happens most of the time, but you get excessive destruction of platelets. Your platelets drop really low. Because those platelets are low, you get um, little broken vessels, papura and petechiae, right? Petechiae are the small red dots. Papura is a bit bigger, but basically this is bruising in the skin just from um, broken vessels. Uh, but if we do a bone marrow, the bone marrow is totally normal. Um, most of the time, this is going to be an acute thing, but self-limiting. It usually often follows a viral illness. It can turn into something chronic, which would mean it lasts more than 12 months. So what we're really looking for are those petechiae and the purpura rash. And here's a nice picture. Um, okay, um, on to DIC. Disseminated intravascular coagulation. This is 
abnormal consum a consumptive coagulopathy. So it uses up all of your uh, stuff, all of your pieces for doing clotting. Um, something triggers it usually, uh, and for kids, usually this is a complication of sepsis. Um, but it can be triggered by hypoxia, acidosis, shock, endothelial damage, or sepsis. And if you are up in PEDS ICU, um, sepsis is what usually happens there. So what happens is we abnormally activate the coagulation process. So because that happens, then um, all the those clotting factors get used up and you get these little microclots that then plug up the circulation. So it plugs and destroys the microcirculation. The body then goes into fibrinolysis trying to break down those clots. So now we have no clotting products for when we do need to clot and we've secreted all the fibrinolysis uh, products to make us not clot even if we had the, the pieces to clot. Um, so uh, these kids, we're going to see prolonged clotting times and we need to give them, um, actually the odd thing is early on we give them heparin so that they don't make the clots, but once they've used up all their clotting products, then we have to start giving them clotting products in fresh frozen plasma. So here's kind of what I was just saying. You trigger this, you use up all of your uh clotting products which makes you bleed and because you have all those clots you start going into fibrinolysis which makes you bleed and then ischemia and red blood cell damage go along with that so hemophilia this is a group of again hereditary so these are uh, genetic disorders um, where you do not make one of the clotting factors the most common one is factor eight and almost all hemophilia is X-linked recessive. So that means a female who has two X's has one X with the hemophilia, but because she has two and it's recessive, she doesn't have the disorder. But her sons, she's gonna give half of her sons the normal X and half of them the abnormal X. Because the sons don't have any other X, those half of her sons who got that abnormal X will have the disorder. Of her daughters, half will be carriers and half will not. Um, so this can go anywhere between very severe and not that severe at all, just depending on how much clotting factor they do or don't have. Um, and here's what I just said. So the mother is a carrier, half her daughters become carriers, half her sons have the disorder. So we see bleeding anywhere from mild to severe. Um, usually this is going to begin six months of age, right? Babies don't bang into things till they start being mobile. Once they start being mobile, we're going to see bruising. Um, the common places, uh, bleeding into the joints is, um, you know, a, a problem. Bloody noses is a problem. Bleeding in the GI tract, bleeding after procedures so that you have a tooth pulled or a minor surgery and you just don't stop bleeding and then um, subcutaneous intramuscular hemorrhages so bruising this is the kid who falls and gets a bruise and instead of it you know just being there and then kind of turning yellow and green and all of that it just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing so how do we treat this well we give them whatever clotting factor they're missing um, we also can give DDAV, D, DDAVP, which um, can increase the amount of factor that they have, and that's often used for mild hemophilia. Uh, when they're, if they've lost a lot of blood somewhere that from their bleeding, though, we're going to have to do transfusion. So we're going to try and prevent, control if they do have bleeding. Um, we want to make sure they're well supervised when they're doing stuff. Any dental procedure needs to know about it. No electric, or use an electric razor, no blades. Uh, for bleeding, put ice on it and then um, the factors.